This conference will now be recorded. Uh, Chair McLaughlin is unable to be here tonight, so I will be chairing this meeting as first vice chair. Uh, Mr. Ellis, we have a roll call determination forum, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Staff of the County, the Honorable Cindy Lamb. Present. The Honorable Mark Greenberg. Here. Yeah. I don't know how honorable I am. What? We're not that honorable. Bristol Bandy. Here. Meg Bump, uh, Meg Bumpy. Uh, Thomas Coon. Spotsylvania County. The Honorable Tim McLaughlin is not here. Yeah. Not there. Chris Yakubuski. Here. David Ross. Yeah. Here. Kevin Marshall. Uh, <laughs> Deborah Fraser. Gary Skinner. Lee Fredericksburg, Matt Kelly, here. Jason Graham, here. Tom Baruli, here. Mike Whitley, last sports game in the ACC is the Oliver Matt Kelly. Here, Bob Fields. Uh, Fred Johnson, Jason Jackson, Aiden Quirk, King George County, and Kupka, Kathy Binder, here. Caroline County, Jeffrey City, City, Jeffrey Black, the FTA, Tony Holland, Federal Highways, Ivan Rucker, PRTC, Bob Schneider, here. Yeah. Uh, Representative of the Secretary, Marcy Parker. Here. Michelle Schottrier. VDOT, Susan Gardner. Here. Stephen Haynes. Here. Uh, DRPT, Todd Horsby. Here. J.R. Williams. Commonwealth Transportation Board, David Grecker. CTEC. Uh, Hank Schaffenberg, can I put that correctly? Of course, sir. <laughs> I'll practice that one. Um, Matthew Rowe. Great. That's the chair. Uh, that includes roll call, and you do have a forum. Thank you. Mr. Chair, can I? Has it, uh, Mr. Rucker from Federal Highways moved on? We have a new representative, don't we? They switched back. Okay. Thank you. Oh, what? So, oh, that's a new one. That answers that question. <laughs> Okay, All right, thank you. Uh, next item is the approval of the September 20th policy committee agenda. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Everyone sign. Motion carries. Next, uh, public involvement. Comments and questions from members of the public are welcome at this time. Staff will also read comments submitted by the public prior to the meeting. We have one public comment that was submitted prior to the meeting. All right, please, sir. Okay. Uh, this environment is specific to what is needed in our region to remove barriers and obstacles to our transportation system, making it accessible and safe for those who are physically disabled. This is just the beginning. Plus, it is extremely important that all accommodations and related equipment be regularly checked and well maintained to keep them viable, accurate, and in working order. The latter serves no purpose. If they are not usable and left that way for long periods of time, Replacement parts and supplies should be purchased and stored for immediate use when needed. The latter is a big part of frustration that challenges challenge passengers face. Getting to work, school, and medical appointments in a timely and consistent manner is necessary to keeping their jobs, pursuit of studies, and medical treatment. One, sidewalks should be made contiguous with existing residential neighborhoods near all bus routes to allow safe access to bus stops and to allow passengers to wait on a solid cement slab platform suitable for wheelchairs, slope access to curbs if needed. Two, new sidewalks and identified areas that do not provide a safe, paved, not on the roadway access to transit stops and or stations should be created for pedestrians with or without guide dogs. Those using walkers and wheelchairs can't afford or are able to drive a vehicle to provide safe egress. Special attention should be afforded to designated retirement in 55 plus communities. Three, safe and easy access via sidewalks to adjoining businesses, medical offices, hospitals, public libraries, social services, et cetera. This should include large parking lots and ladders with posted crosswalks. 
Four, audible signals, walk, don't walk at frequent intervals on the streets and are busy intersections requiring transit passengers who need to cross streets, train tracks, zero and track station parking lots to access their stops in order to continue their trip or return to their point of origin. Five, at transit centers and unmanned stations, all safety related and directional signing should be accessible on the top portion of a bench on both sides of the track where a blind person can read its braille messages. Service dogs for the blind are taught to find the seat, thereby allowing the blind person to find the message attached to the bench. This accommodation should be advertised via an audio announcement, particularly at unmanned stations for Amtrak. Six, all announcements should have an LED readout in English and Spanish for deaf passengers at all local transit centers relating to arrival, departure, train track, numbers for the latter. Emergency or interruption service messages should also be read to there and delivered in a timely way. Seven, for those passengers that cannot access transit due to code failures of bus lifts, leaning bus hydraulic, <laughs> failed diversion plans, et cetera, should be offered by authorized transit personnel free taxi service to their destination via authorized reimbursement form. This allows for timely arrival to jobs, education, training, coursework, medical appointments, science, urgent health care. And that was from Jane Leeds, a sample resident. Thank you. Do we have anybody here uh, who wishes to uh, comment at this time? Anyone online? All right, hearing none, public involvement. Move to the consent agenda. So second. Hearing motion and second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? Chair, both sides. Motion carried. Number six, the FAMPO administrator report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll kick off straight away. Um, Matthew, if you can switch to the next slide. So we're going to be looking at just the COVID impacts on traffic and on transit ridership. Just a little information about the new Virginia Passenger Rail Authority and their statewide rail plan. Well, the statewide rail plan of the DRPT, um, the CMAC STBG process, and where we are in all of that, and a couple of other things. So, in terms of CMP, the congestion management process, this provides a snapshot of the character of the major roadways in order to find solutions for congestion problems. As FAMPA administrator, I'm officially required to alert you to this process and to alert you to the fact that we are monitoring. The particular thing you should pay attention to, and this is in the slides, and you'll get a copy uh, emailed as well and on the website. Um, this tells you where we are on our website hosting all this information. So you can go dig into it and see what um, is there and start monitoring that. We have a dashboard with metrics for each corridor monitored, and you can view that on that website. We look at the at congestion, speed, travel time, etc., for weekday weekend times and it's currently available for the April to June of 2021. We'll update it as time moves on. But um, we are monitoring this and it's one of our tasks as an MPO that we have to do. This is where you can find the information. What is happening with COVID? I do this about once every quarter just to give you a picture. When COVID's over, I might not really need to focus on this so much. But just to give you an idea of where the traffic is, that's the traffic volume. There's a type of apologies by vehicle type. Um, that is the statewide metric. The red shows you where the truck freight volume is on the roads. The orange shows you where the cars are. And blue is the all vehicle traffic. Zero is where we were before COVID, right? So you can see freight growth continues. And other vehicles, there's been a slight dip in August, but it's probably will pick up in September. But if you look at that, we're almost at pre-COVID levels for all traffic, apart from this little dip during the month of August, which um, you can think about. Um, there was a dip again, you can see in January and February, um, but that was the middle of the start of the COVID period. You can see the dip over there. Um, this is just for the Fredericksburg district. So if we look local, that's what the picture looks like locally, um, up to again August the 22nd, you can see the freight has picked up and the other traffic has slightly slowed down, um, remembering that that's zero. 
transit, what's happening with transit picture? I just want to point out that these two lines are not in scale. And the reason for that is the um, VRE uh, traffic is so much higher before COVID than all the other forms of uh, transit that the graph is very difficult to read if I put it in at scale. So just be aware that those two dotted lines are not at scale because of that particular reason. But just for you to look at the trends, it starts in April 2020 and goes through to August now. And the blue is VRE, the orange is Fred bus, um, and the silver gray is Omniride. And you can see the trend is starting to trend up for Omniride and VRE, but off a small base. And that's why I'm telling you that this is not the scale, because it's off a small base, but it's going in the right direction. Fred bounced back quicker than Omniride and Rail to about 60% of their ridership, but it's starting to plateau now. I know that Fred will tell you when they have opportunities in the future that they are introducing new service. Um, what is the date for your new morning, early hour service? October 18th. From October 18th, they'll be introducing new services, and you should see that reflected after October 18th in the graph. They bounce back quickly to about 60%. VRE and, and Omniride, Bob will tell you, is much below that level, that 60% level, but you can see it started these VRE and Omni rides are starting to bounce back now, um, even though we still have lots of people in the hospital and COVID is still around, right? That just brings a narrow scope just to 2021, January. You can see the trend line over here uh, for transit is generally going up. So that's where we are now. The Virginia Passenger Rail Authority, we need to think about this just from the point of view that the, the role in rail is being split. So DRPT will continue to do freight rail services in the state. The Virginia Passenger Rail Authority is going to deal with anything to do with passengers effectively on rail. Transit is still going to fall under DRPT and commuter programs will fall under DRPT. But as such, FAMPA doesn't currently have representatives from the Virginia Passenger Rail Authority because it's a brand new organization that is newly established and I'm assuming in time we will get correspondence from them and we may need to think about do we you know uh, change the makeup of the tech for example to include a member or will they be represented through the RPT or we don't know how that's all going to play out but it is a new a new institution in our state which we need to take cognizance of over time. The Virginia sorry the DRPT statewide rail plan is to Effectively, the LRTP for DRPT, so their long range plan. And they're busy reviewing it like us. They have to review this plan every four years, I believe. And so the last one was adopted by the CTB in 2018. They now have to do a new one, and they're currently going through the process. <clears throat> um, it includes a four year and a 20 year horizon, and they're busy developing what should the rail system look like in the future. So we have opportunities to comment on that. They did initial scoping meetings and they're currently now starting outreach in fall again on their projects that they're proposing to implement in the future, both for freight and passenger rail. Um, and then they're going to refine those projects. My suggestion, you'll see at the end of the slide, is that we invite somebody from DRPT to tell us where they are in this plan and to invite your input as the policy committee, because we need to have an opportunity to comment on it. And I suggest, my suggestion, Mr. Chair, is that we perhaps at our next meeting, invite them to come to a short presentation, just this is where they are, these are the projects they envision, and to get all of your comments on those projects as they develop. It's like their LRTP, and you would get comments on that sort of document. The new parking rights facility in Spotsylvania, just to Point out to you, construction has a commenced. You had a groundbreaking ceremony. This is where it's located. That's around exit 126 on the I 95. Uh, it's costing 16.5 million. It includes a dedicated area for transit arrivals and departures to the passenger shelter. There's facilities for carpools and van pools with a separate pickup and drop off lane. Total of 683 parking spaces. So it's quite a big new project which we're excited about. 
Um, and there's going to be accessible parkings in the lot, as well as motorcycle parkings, the parking, I think you find the bicycle rack, and a shared use park built along Route 1. So it's quite a significant new project in our region. CMAC STBG, we need to review this methodology. You'll remember we had some disagreement as to which projects should be approved in our last round. So we need to review this particular policy. Um, we had a minor update because of the benefits of the TMA. You'll remember that process. It was slightly before my time, but uh, that's the last major change that occurred. We have to have a call, well, we had a call for projects in spring, and uh, we need to do a more extensive update. The TAC has established a subcommittee to meet on a routine basis, and we will be looking at um, the things that need to be adjusted <laughs> in the policy, improved in the policy. We do have a deadline for initial comments, so if you have a policy committee any comments, please send those to us so that we can include them before the TAC meets again. The fall TTV meeting inputs, the opportunity for us to speak to the Secretary for Transportation, to the CTV in the public meetings that they have, but that's going to be coming up. We don't have an exact date and that kind of thing yet. But I'd like to be ahead of the curve so that we thought about what we want to say before it's rushed on us at the last minute and we have to decide what it is that we have to say. I don't know what it is we have to say, but I like us to think ahead of time. So we're collect collecting suggestions from our partners, from board members, from, from the TAC, from our committee, as to what it is um, you think we should be saying in those meetings. My request is for you all to give me um, your inputs. You can pop me an email or something. And then I'm going to compare, compile a list of the suggestions from everybody, take it to our committees, bring it to the policy committee at your next meeting. So at least we've thought through this a little bit more robustly than we did last time. Last time we did a last minute rush, we just took projects that the, the policy committee had voted on in the past and raised those. I think we should just think about this a little more carefully. So I'm giving a little bit of advanced warning to just say, please send me your ideas. We'll work up a short list as staff, present it, bring it back to you and, and the committees. <clears throat> so that at least then when we go to those four meetings, we've got at least some robust thought about what it is that we really need to raise. Remember, we raise typically big projects. We don't talk about one little local intersection because there are other processes down for that. So it's only if there's a big important project that we raise. But what are those important projects that we think we should raise um, and get some agreement on those? So I'm suggesting we do that. So think about roadway issues, bike bed issues, transit issues, resiliency or possible planning issues. What are the issues that we need to deal with? I'm not going to tell you what they are. I'm asking for your input. I'll compile a list and then you can discover it at the next meeting if that needs your approval. So here are my four points. I suggest we invite the DRP to give a short presentation on their new standby rail plan. Please give comments on the CTB meeting, which I've spoken about. Just to point out the CTB conformity meeting, we need to look at the TIP projects and the LRTP projects and do the air quality analysis. Um, so that is going to be off and we'll hear about that under the LRTV presentations. And tonight you will hear, I think it's the next item, the Lafayette Boulevard study. The final report will be coming to the next meeting, but you're going to get a preview tonight with the consultant who's been working on the project. Remember this project started also a year or two ago, there's been a phase one this is the phase two, which VDOT has been managing for us, and it's coming now to fruition and completion. So the next presentation will just tell you where that all is, and um, then the actual report will be coming to the next policy committee meeting. Mr. Chair, that's my report. If there are any questions, I'll take them. Otherwise, we'll move on to the next item. Mr. Uh, dropping back to the state Virginia Passenger Rail Authority. Yes. Uh, there is discussion now at the BRE level on the makeup of that board to request from the legislature that they expand membership to include specific, they're talking specific representatives from NBTC and PRTC, because those are two major organizations in which we are sponsoring, where of course we are a PRTC. And I don't know if, if you all want to give any direction on 
it, it's, this is going to happen. It's, it's going to have to happen with all the major players going to the state and saying, we want more representation. If we go by ourselves, it's going to go nowhere. And I didn't know if we want to kind of latch on to that and, as a support and then have a separate discussion within PRTC about sometimes limiting or having some of those appointments, either staggered, whatever, where a member of FANPO is included in that. That's what it, and two, there's also ongoing discussions with the state's plan, which is now the state is going gangbusters on planning and doing additional things, which they have come to the VRE board and said, oh, by the way, we want more financial support from VRE to move some of these projects forward. And that discussion is coming up in that context too of state when you came to VRE a few years ago, you said you gave us money, therefore you should have a vote on VRE. Well, if you're now asking for us to donate or give money, which we are for the Long Bridge project and potentially another project, then we want a greater voice uh, on the, uh, that because the, the biggest issue with that for us long term is the state's looking at the entire state and the state's looking at all kinds of of train related projects. We're a small part of that in commuter rail. And there is some of us express some concerns that the state is going to be focusing more on building new lines and using those road beds that they have or rail beds that they've acquired to expand service out to the west and everything else like that. And what impact is that going to have on future funding for commuter rail, which frankly is a lot more important to us. So we really need to have a seat at that table. So maybe at the next meeting we can have some type of resolution making our views known to our parent organization, uh, PRTC, about what role we want to see Mr. in that. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, might I add to uh, uh, Kelly? Um, I wrote down something very similar, uh, but I was going to go to Baco. I'm not on the Transportation Committee subcommittee anymore, so I don't know what they're working on, but it really begged the question, like you're saying, going to whatever and having coalescing our voices makes sense to me. So uh, in preparation to hopefully that'll happen next time, I'll contact Baco and I'll copy you on whatever I find out if, if no one here knows the answer. So everybody know. If the chair, if you'd like, if the board would like us to bring a resolution, you just need to give us some direction as a group as to what exactly you want in there. No, when we get there, we'll do it. <laughs> Mr. Chair, what I'll do is, if it's all right, I'll keep, from what we had at the last meeting, there may be some things that are be coming up very soon, and, and that's this can be part of the discussion. I know the legislative committee of PRTC is looking at putting something together, so if I get some semblance of what exactly they're looking at, get an idea that states supposedly can hear something either later this week, by the end of the month, the beginning of October, we'll swing back to you and see what we can put together to at least circulate before the meeting. By all means, if you send anything to our office, we'll gladly circulate it to all the members. All right, motion. Thank you for that. Anyone else? All right, thank, thank, you. thank you. All right, moving on to our action discussion items. First up is the Lafayette Boulevard traffic study update. Uh, Mr. Harris is uh, coming to us uh, online this evening. Mr. Harris. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. All right, great. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to present uh, some of the findings and recommendations from the Lafayette Boulevard Corridor Study. Uh, we can get right started. So during this presentation, I'm going to go over some near-term recommendations at four locations, uh, some long-term considerations, and then some uh, potential access management improvements um, within the city of Fredericksburg. So when, when we're looking at these near-term recommendations, the goal is to come up with low-cost improvements, potentially for a smart-scale application, where um, you know, projects all throughout the state or each construction district are scored against each other in a cost-benefit <coughs> type ranking system. But these near-term recommendations 
also try to recognize future planned improvements um, that are either funded or or not funded. <clears throat> so let's get let's get started. Um, the, so this is a summary page. These are the four locations: Twin Lake Drive, Old Greenwich Drive, at Harrison Road, and uh, the furthest south is Mall Drive and Falcon Drive. That intersection. Next slide, please. So this this is the recommendation at Twin Lake Twin Lake Drive. Here we're recommending a restricted crossing U-turn or an R cut. What this does is this eliminates the left turn um, coming out of Twin Lake Drive and relocates it so that uh, all all vehicles have to turn right and then you turn to make their original destination to the north. Um, what this does is it addresses a statewide and district level safety need. And that is one of the smart scale scoring categories. So we wanted to make sure we definitely address that need. And it, it improves the future level of service at this intersection um, from a B to A during the AM peak period and a C to a B during the PM peak period. It's also a significant decrease, decrease in future delay for the northbound movement, as well as those vehicles coming out of Twin Lake Drive. And when you're removing that left turn phase out of the signal, it allows us to reallocate other green time to the, those other movements. So that's why we're seeing those decreases in delay. Um, a couple other things about this, um, it does, this project does at a crosswalk on the east side of Lafayette Boulevard, not a, uh, a sidewalk along the portion of the project and also a crosswalk at the intersection itself connecting the existing drive, the existing sidewalk on Twin Lake Drive to that new proposed sidewalk system. And this will <coughs> actually... Um, require a rebuild of that traffic signal at this intersection. And um, right here we have our preliminary uh, construction costs, right-of-way costs, and then a total project cost of about $4 million. Um, next slide, please. So this is at Old Greenwich Road. Um, what we are recommending here is the addition of a right turn lane. And this is mostly in the existing pavement footprint um, at that location. And this will improve the future level of service and the PM peak hour from a level of service D to a level of service C. Um, a significant increase in delay uh, for that future northbound movement. And then um, you know, we are adding a right turn lane, so it's also a significant decrease in future delay for right turns coming out of uh, Greenwich Drive. Um, you can see the construction cost is a little bit over a million dollars. The right-of-way and utility, uh, slightly under a million dollars, and that is because there are some utility poles here, um, but the total cost is just under two million. Um, Next slide, please. Okay, so this is at the Harrison Road intersection. <coughs> um, this recommendation is to add a right turn lane um, on, on Harrison Road. And in addition to that, we're going to add sidewalk on Harrison Road for the length of the project. Um, and that is, you know, further west on Harrison we can't see it in this image, but there is sidewalk um, under construction as well. So hopefully this will eventually create a full sidewalk network um, along Harrison. Um, you can see on the east side here of Lafayette Boulevard, that light blue dashed line, that is sidewalk that has already been constructed. So again, we're gonna add a crosswalk and a little sidewalk to connect to that, to have that um, connected sidewalk network. And then um, we're also proposing sidewalk uh, further north along Lafayette Boulevard. And again, this is gonna just 
um, decrease future delay for the right turns and um, left turns um, from northbound Lafayette Boulevard. And the construction cost, a little bit over $2 million. The right of way and utility is a little bit over a million dollars for a total cost of approximately three and a half million. Next slide, please. Okay, this is that, that intersection all the way to the south. Um, it's actually just north of that Route 1 intersection. And here, um, we're recommending to change the access um, on the west side of La Lafayette Boulevard to a right in, a right out, actually eliminating left turns into and out of that driveway. So we're also um, removing the northbound left turn into that driveway. And what this does is by removing that left turn phase, again, that's just extra green time that we can reallocate to other movements that have more traffic volumes. And so you get a, a improvement <laughs> in future level of service from a D to a level of service of B uh, for both peak periods. And this is also a significant um, decrease in future delay for all movements. This is a great recommendation. And you can see the low cost, um, you know, about $300,000 in construction, $200,000 in right of way and utilities for a total cost of about half a million dollars. Um, so these, those were our near term recommendations. Um, as we move on to the next slide, these are long term considerations. Okay, not recommended as part of the study, but more feasibility, is it possible? So what we looked at here was actually widening out Lafayette Boulevard um, from Falcon Drive up to Harrison Road. And obviously this will, um, the widening will be from its existing three lanes. It's got one lane in each direction with that two-way left turn lane. <laughs> this would actually be four lanes, two lanes in each direction. So, of course, that's going to increase the capacity along the roadway. But um, one of the things we talked about in our stakeholder meetings was the potential for a one-way pair um, with Lassen Lane and Harrison Road. So, one of those roads would be one way in one direction, and the other one would be one way in the other direction. And by widening out this section of Lafayette Boulevard, that would just add more capacity for those for those vehicles that are kind of making that those one way movements to get to their destination. And we're going to look at a few close up views here in a minute, but you can see the the total construction cost about four and a half million right away, a little bit over three million for a total cost of approximately seven and a half million. But if we could move on to this next slide. This is kind of a zoomed in view of the southern portion of the corridor. And you can see we're widening uh, towards Route 1. And this is going to avoid impacts to the residential properties um, on the east side of Lafayette. <coughs> and also, um, that keeps intact that new sidewalk um, that's going to be constructed along Lafayette. And then it's already been constructed further north. Um, and the way we've designed this, conceptually designed it, it still does allow for dedicated left turn lane into Falcon Drive. Um, next slide, please. And, and this is just further to the north. Um, you can see again, we're just widening towards Route 1. Um, and this is mostly within the existing pavement footprint. <laughs> the purples, the purple area is the existing pavement, and you can see those small um, yellow shaded areas. That's where we're actually just going to need new pavement. Um, and you can see that yellow line, dashed line, um, I guess just under our improvement, that is that sidewalk that has already been constructed um, that I showed on that Harrison Road improvement. Uh, next slide, please. Um, 
so the other long-term consideration is basically new and a new access road um, to the south of BRE lot. And so what we did was we um, we laid out the alignment here that you that you can see, and we tried to avoid <coughs> the um, archaeological and architectural um, constraints in the era. You can see those blue and red outlines while also avoiding um, that structure uh, next to the railroad, trying to fit that through there. And so um, there will be the new roadway alignment, which is one lane in each direction, but the proposed connection at Dixon Street Route 2 is a hybrid roundabout. And um, if we can go to the next slide, this is kind of a close-up of the hybrid roundabout. And you'll see that it's actually two lanes in each direction for those major through movements, northbound and southbound, um, while the minor movements actually, they only have one lane. And the roundabout itself has only one true circulating lane. And what that does is that just <coughs> increases the safety of the roundabout. Um, decreases confusion for new or elderly drivers, but um, mostly maintains the capacity um, with those two through lanes in, in each direction on the on the um, Dixon Street main line. Um, and the the total cost, if we flip right back to that previous slide, um, yeah, about seven and a half million dollars for this improvement. And um, if you just want to click down two, we'll get to the, the last component. So these are potential access management improvements um, within the city limits um, along our study corridor. So um, on the, for this graphic on the left, uh, I'm showing that that's the the study corridor within the city of Fredericksburg. <coughs> um, Twin Lakes was our northern, most northern point of the study. And just north of Twin Lakes, you know, that's being redeveloped anyway with that nice new big, and I think, I believe that's going to be a hybrid roundabout as well. But focusing on our study corridor, the blue lines here, those sections of Lafayette Boulevard are primarily residential driveways. Um, for access points where you know you, you can't landlock a house and take away their only their only access point but this portion in the center where I've called out the inset this is um, just around that new family dollar just north of Hillcrest Street there are some opportunities for potential access management um, the Bellman's Plaza shopping center that's on the left you know it's got multiple access points um uh and the dry and the, the parking lots are actually connected so there is a potential there to consolidate those access points um and and possibly stripe out uh an, an inner parcel connection um and then also in this area at the hillcrest drive intersection um there are these two the, these two areas where um, the the commercial ent entrance frontage is, is just the entire length of um, the property, and so there could be opportunities to put in um, some restrictions, some curb, just so that it's not a free for all of cars entering and exiting and pulling out on the Lafayette Boulevard. Um, especially with that two-way left turn lane, um, you know, it, it's possible for cars to come in and out just about anywhere in those big white circles. So these are just some areas where there is the potential to um, work out some access management. And, you know, as new development occurs, <coughs> you know, their site plans and approvals, you know, um, the city can dictate additional access management as other parcels develop more. 
but these were the ones that I could identify along our study corridor. And, and that concludes my presentation. Um, are we taking questions? Yes. Does anybody have any questions for Mr. Harris? I've got one. Um, Mr. Harris, you've identified about $10 million in near term and $15 million in long term projects. For each of those figures, has there been any sort of analysis conducted on what an alternative investment in, say, a bus transit would do for reducing congestion on our roadways? No, sir. All right. I don't believe I should defer to my colleagues from BDOT, but there is the phase one of the study which specifically only focused on the concept. So there is, I mean, I don't want to fade one off against the other, but the phase one is <coughs> on the same part. Okay. Right, so. <coughs> so, this is a quick question. We've been studying Lafayette Boulevard for a long time and have come to the conclusion. It was the first study that we did that crossed jurisdictional lines. We, we looked at Lafayette Boulevard from downtown Fredericksburg all the way to Jeff Davis Highway through Spotsbury County. And on a project like this, I was kind of wondering why you focus on widening on the on northern end, which is fine. I think we need to do that, but didn't really look at more improvements and widening on the city side. I was kind of wondering. And we, we did this with the Fall Hill Avenue. Originally, <coughs> we were going to do it in sections, and we knew that, frankly, you widen four lanes, and then it suddenly goes back to two lanes. You just pushed everything down a little bit, and you still got problems. Is there a reason why you didn't go a little bit longer down this as a whole project and looking at widening the whole thing? Uh, yeah, actually, there is. Um, so the original scope of the study uh, called for looking for <coughs> ways to use the existing pavement width. Like I said, there's one way, there's one lane in each direction, and that two-way left turn lane. So we looked at a couple scenarios that I didn't go over here, but we looked at two lanes northbound and one lane southbound. We looked at two lanes northbound and one lane southbound. And then we also looked at a series of roundabouts along the corridor while still maintaining um, that three lanes, one lane in each direction with the two-way left turn lane. And operationally, none of those worked. So, um, you know, it, you know, I, I did not want to turn in a report with no recommendations. So what we did instead was we looked at spot recommendations that we that could actually be constructed, and that's what you've seen here. Late in the process, the stakeholder group uh, did request to look at that portion of Lafayette Boulevard between Harrison and um, Mall Drive. Uh, because I believe Spotsylvania County has in their comp plan the potential for that one-way pair. So that was kind of a, a feasibility to see even if it, that is possible at a low cost or a relatively low cost. And so that, that the, uh, further study can be done uh, for that one-way pair. Did that answer your question? Yeah, I'm just looking at this. To me, Lafayette Boulevard is a joint project between the city and Spotsylvania. <coughs> to be successful, we're going to have to coordinate when improvements are done, where it's done, and frankly, back each other up when our projects are going forward to make this project fit, not just kind of looking at it from what bigger projects we can do on our side. Because I do believe we have most of right of way on our side. I don't know what the situation is Spotsylvania County. We have some of the right of way, do we not? Okay. On that section of, I think we did. I'm not sure. Okay. I thought we had got, we've done a pretty good job identifying and acquiring and or through things the right way. But that would be something interesting to look at. Mr. Chair, um, uh, I don't know if we don't want to comment, but the, the um, right of way is limited and there has been efforts put in to try to get 
both a sidewalk on the one side and a multi-use path on the other side. And all of those who participated in this stakeholder group will, you know, tell you about people pulling their hairs out. And Zach will tell you how we pushed him heavily to try and incorporate more and more. And the right of way is X. So you would have to acquire additional right of way to add more lanes. I think if Zach or Stephen, if, if I, am I correct? In other words, we've used as much as we can of the existing right away <coughs> and if you wanted more lanes. So, am I misrepresenting it at all? No, that's, that's accurate. Uh, I would point out that Banco did a, a study on Lafayette Boulevard like eight, ten years ago. Wow. That's and we recommended, uh, you know, four lanes with the meeting. And of course, that comes with a very high price thing. Realistically, the, the way we're looking at all of our studies anymore or, or stars type of approach where we're looking for affordable solution that will fare well for well screen in for well in small scale and so that's really the, these smaller projects are kind of the way we're guided uh with regard to our recommendations one last time the only reason i'm kind of concerned with it, a little bit of that approach is if possibly goes ahead and puts in or the or the wide new paper section only down the Harris Road. Then frankly we still got bottleneck. So unless we kind of coordinate some of these bigger projects, it doesn't make sense for Spotsylvania County to go full bore on a seven or eight million dollar project. I mean it, it does better access to your area, Spotsylvania, but for the whole corridor, it's not mm -hmm. really going to result in the level of improvement we're looking for. That's why I'm trying to get a sense of what is what are we capable of doing about it? If it's a big cost, we need to know it's a big cost. I know it's a big cost, but I just don't want to see us going down the road to do a lot of little projects. I mean, what was originally that first phase is fine. It makes small incremental improvements that improve the traffic flow that come up. When we start talking about widening and saying, all right, we'll widen this now, and maybe in the next few years we'll widen the next part, we all know how that works. And I just would rather not see us spend a whole lot of money on this road unless it's coordinated effort to move traffic all the way down this floor. Well, I appreciate it and it, it makes sense on the smaller stuff, the bigger stuff here. I get kind of queasy about it because I think it's just spending a lot of money to do a lot of widening without any plan to continue it to make it actually work. That's all. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, was this a star study? No, this study actually came about uh, the technical study, the phase two of the phase one of the transit uh, a lot of here, and this is the roadway. This is the roadway. And it came in the possession of VDOT because Sampo staffing would decrease greatly uh, the loss of the administrator. And we took that over and sort of saved the Sampo. And then we ran into COVID, it was delayed for about a year, and then we finally complete. So it's really a fantasy. But, but again, we do, we still are looking at it from a sort of star perspective. It seems star like, you know, yeah. there's one. Yeah. Uh, then remind me who was the stakeholder group? You mentioned that several times that you had interactions with that stakeholder group. Who were they? Um, it, we had representatives of the city of Frenchburg. And the South of any county as well as the NPO and Okay, I just want to make sure they were involved. Yeah. Okay. All right, thank you, sir. Yes, thanks. Um, quick question. Uh, was this study coordinated with any of the handful of studies that have already been done in Fort Mount Fork and Lafayette? Um, because I know that VDOT has worked with some developers along that way. Um, we also have a smart scale project on Fort Mount Fork. Um, was that taken into account? Yeah. It was because what I was told from the uh, Lafayette study that was done that I know that VDOT had worked with the uh, developers for a project halfway down, was that if you improve Fort Mile Fort, uh, Route 1 gets used a lot more and the traffic on Lafayette drops significantly. So if that was taken into account, it doesn't seem like that, just from what I'm looking at, that all of these, these big uh, projects on Lafayette need to be done, perhaps that's uh, 10, 15 years from now. But if you're improving Four Mile Fort, getting people off a of Lafayette on the Route 1, um, it, it, I'm just saying it just looks like it's not, it, it, then the projects weren't looked at together, or the, the studies weren't looked at together. 
Well, the traffic that was used for this took into account the improvements that were in place. And the funding for the four mile four intersection it did. was was recently. So okay. to be honest with you, yeah. it's possible that that four mile four intersection improvement uh, would not have been requested. But anything prior to that would have been. That was around four smart city. <coughs> okay. Maybe uh, do you uh, Zach? Do you know about that? I can tell you that we did not get any traffic volumes uh, from that study, but we did incorporate all the traffic volumes from the development, incoming developments to the north, um, which are added a massive amount of volume to this roadway. Are, are those the ones that have been approved or the proposed ones? Approved. Right, so that's the city, not not us, because we don't have anything else yet right now. Um, okay, thank you. Any other questions? All right, thank you, Mr. Harris. All right, moving on to a smart scale round five initial project selection. So. Um, smart scale round five, we know the joint presentation from Ian and I, we're going to go to the first few slides and then Ian's going to jump in. Um, so you all saw part of this presentation with the last meeting, um, we've been through our technical advisory committee. So the schedule, of course, we're in September, so we're looking at basically our submitted list of projects from localities and what they would like to be on the regional stamp open GDRC list, and then we're looking at potentially asking VDOT for preliminary VDOT assistance for our list of 10 projects. So here's a list of all the submitted projects between um, the three sample jurisdictions. There are also projects from Carolyn and George counties, however, those are their local projects. So these are the projects here. Um, and this list you guys have all seen before. Um, we scored these projects based on the LRTP prioritization methodology. Um, so these are the scores for the roadway projects. And these are the scores for the active transportation projects. One thing you'll notice is the two projects here in the city of Fredericksburg. Uh, the Riverfront Corridor, Bankside Trail, and Dixon Park Connector, these are actually scored separately. They were scored previously from when we got word on what the actual projects were. So these projects are scored separately. However, the top line here is what the full project is, and that's a combination of all those projects below it. Thank you. So what Matthew is explaining to you is that, for example, this VCR regional project is the combination of all of the VCR projects into one mega project. And we similarly, you'll see Lafayette Boulevard Roadway and bike bed improvements. We have worked with the uh, staff of the city and the staff of Spotsylvania to come up with a joint project that includes a number of these improvements rolled into one. And similarly, the same thing has happened with, uh, where is the other one, Matthew? Route 2. Route 2. Uh, Lansdowne Road, Route 17. Again, here we've got the city staff and the Spotsylvania staff together, and we worked on a joint project for this project. So all that I'm telling you is that this VCR project, this project, and this project, each one of them is not a single improvement. It's bringing together all of the improvements in that area into one project, and it becomes then a joint project that both jurisdictions in each case are able to support. So they're, they're joint projects by those two jurisdictions because the particular project crosses political boundaries. So we got the staff together, we got beat up together with them, and we workshopped those to try to get a joint project. Um, and so this is the set of projects that are being recommended by staff with input from our, our staff of the jurisdictions. But according to the scoring that Matthew just showed you earlier. So we've joined some projects to come up with a list, and we've got a list for GWRC on the left, a list for FAMPA on the right, and these are the projects that we're suggesting. What is going to happen now from after today is that we have to submit a pre-approval pre list to um, VDOT, which essentially is a request to VDOT to help us with technical work that needs to get done on our set of projects. And they may come back to us with suggested tweaks to the projects. Also to tell you that in a number of these cases, the 
CTB sponsored and VDOT operationalized uh, pipeline studies are still underway. So that studies are not yet concluded. So what that means is the details of some of these projects are going to change after tonight because we're going to get a finalized study out of those pipeline studies from VDOT, which may give suggested tweaks to some of those projects. So in some cases, there is a placeholder project there. We score it on the basis of its location and what it could potentially do for that location. But for example, over here, this Route 2 project, we're still in the process of discussing with staff uh, of the two localities and VDOT to iron out the little details of these projects to make sure that by the time this project, these projects get submitted, we've got the best offer for each project. So we try and get the highest score for each project. So we try and get as many of our projects approved for funding as possible. So this is the state of play now. We're proposing those two lists. Remember, we initially have to submit five, and then after work by a VDOT's um, team, and some responses that we get, we then have to, next year, make a final pre-submission list in the new year, and then a final list, which breaks, in each case, the five down to four. So we eventually have to remove one from this list, and we have to remove one eventually from that list. Stephen, am I, am I good? Okay, is there another slide, I think, after this? Yeah, just one more slide, just discuss it. So here are those next steps. Um, this is a preliminary pre-application pre with just a to be dot. These are the projects we'd like to submit. Please help us to refine these projects so that we score well on the projects. There's technical assistance and other things which VDOT provides. This is not the final, final, final list. It's going to be tweaked in terms of the details um, before the final list. And you will need to approve that pre-approval list next year and the final list next year. So right now, this is the projects we are suggesting to submit to VDOT to request their assistance with the refinement process, which they do for everybody. Um, <coughs> submissions to VDOT for this pre-pre-approval are on October the 15th. The actual pre-approval is next year in, is it February, March? April 1st is the, uh, the pre-application deadline. April 1st, okay. So you're going to have to review this again before the 1st of April to make a final pre-approval submission. And then the final, as you have done um, SmartCal before, know that there's then a final submission. We have to remove two projects from the list. So that's where we are now. And we would suggest that we submit this set of projects um, to read up for the pre-approval request for assistance on um, fleshing out the projects. Um, it does not include projects in Spotsylvania or King George County. They have, sorry, big pardon, Caroline and King George County, um, because they have got lists of projects, but because they are entitled to submit up to five local projects on their local list, and they have only currently got each about five projects, we are going to support them in submitting those as local projects. So we do not need to build into additional Carolina King George projects onto these two lists. So these two lists will come only from Stafford, Spotsylvania, and uh, Fredericksburg jurisdictions. There won't be uh, projects on these two lists for King George and Caroline. And Carrie, Barbara, and others have been working with them in terms of just making sure they understand that the two rural counties have got projects and that they can submit them on their local list. There are other projects, of course, that our jurisdictions are also in the Fanco area submitting on their local lists in addition to these. So these are the regional ones. You've all got your local ones, which you are also submitting. So we'll take any questions from the chair or clarifications. Um, we've got the whole team here as well. If, if anybody wants a technical question, then we've got feed on and so forth. All right. Uh, let's go. Thanks. 
find it interesting and, a, and frankly a good idea to think about it with smart scale combining the Lafayette Boulevard roadway and bike debt improvements. Uh, it, I'm assuming moving forward, we're going to try to do that because right now we've got the rest of the trail projects as a separate project itself. It seems if we're going to game the system, and I hate using that term, <laughs> to smart scale. You know, it would seem more appropriate to put more of the kind of the transit trail oriented projects and marry them to a road improvement. Because my guess is that one would probably score pretty high because it is both transit, trail, and road. We're even thinking of a possible, and, and Jerry and, and Aiden would have to comment, but we're even thinking of a possible transit element for this one as well. So we are thinking to trying to and gaming the system. We we're hoping that Stephen and Marcy and the team from BDOT will help us gain the system because effectively all we're doing is presenting the best possible projects we can in terms of the rules that are there. But we'd like to gain the system with well, the I, I, that's a bad term to use because frankly, in this case, it makes sense. I agree with you. I've seen so many smart scale projects where it made no sense whatsoever mm -hmm. when they just threw a parking lot into a road project just to get it score up. This makes sense. Okay. If you had the transit component or that and with you can expand on it, especially in the Lafayette Boulevard corridor, that would make a lot of sense. And I must say just to all of you um, board members, we are really enthused by the level of support and help we've received from the jurisdictional staff. We've worked with them. Adam, Mark, Matthew, Harry, Jordan, uh, Stacey is on leave today, myself, we've worked with the jurisdictional staff and we're grateful. I mean, we couldn't have put these joint projects together without their support on the detail. And Stephen was in some of the meetings with Bernie Hart, but we actually had these meetings, discuss these things, and they would say, well, can we have this, can we change that? And we worked together as a team. And I think that this is a good precedent going forward where the jurisdictions have to say, you know what? If we combine a joint project, we can get another project on the list by putting these all together. And that's what we've done. And they make sense, Stephen. I think they, I mean, in terms of, you know, these are all on the same corridor. These are all on the VCR. They're not nonsensical, like things that are not contiguous, that are not connected, that are not joined, that are kind of all over the place. We try to make sensible joining of different projects. And uh, I think, I mean, I think it's a good selection. Um, you know, the one five will be next year when we have to decide which two to remove. And I don't look forward to that, but I think these are a good bunch of projects, honestly. Uh, Mr. Kelly, having been coming from one of those jurisdictions we had a project on our list just like that, please forgive us for that. but. I do want you guys to know, and I know you work really well with our staff, but we don't all agree in staff that that's the right list. So we're continuing to have a discussion on it. I know this news to you guys, but in, in a, we fully support the decision matrix you've done. And I know you guys have put a lot of work into it, but that doesn't mean that we still think that's the right list for staff. So we, um, I mean, I think we don't should comment on this, not me in particular, but we are quite happy to make adjustments within the rule. Obviously, we can't break any of the no. rules, but there are some adjustments which we plan to make anyway. This one, this one here is going to be adjusted. Of of is going to show. I'm not, I'm not privy to that conversation, so I don't know what particular things we'd like to change. But within the rules, we we're happy to accommodate. If you think a different combination or something, but that's what we think at the moment is the best. I understand. I understand. I just meant we need to have we Stafford are having internal conversations just about that. I just wanted you to know that. And um, that's it. Okay. And um, Miss Parker, I just realized how that would probably make you angry. So I'm sorry. No, I guess the question I have is: Are you looking at submitting in additional pro or different projects to be scored? Or you don't agree with their scoring of the projects that you submit? I want to talk to our staff about our local projects compared to these projects and how we ended up with a different priority than I know I personally thought of. Other staff members or other uh, supervisors can say something differently. So the Honestly, you know how important Route 1 is to me, right? So, so I want to personally understand how that rack can stack that Route 1 co-landing as Critical it showed in the STAR study that it ended up not being there. 
I want to know what it is. That doesn't mean that's anything wrong with the scoring. It could be our leverage funding. It could be anything like that. I just want to go check that. I wanted you to know. Is that all right? Well, I mean, this is so the FAMPO scoring is something completely different than the smart skills. Group. I mean, Correct. it's based on that, and you know, we haven't done it really before, so this will be a good year to mm -hmm. see how does it compare to the smart scale scoring. So, what happens before you submit it, whether you agree or don't agree, that's that's all here. Okay, but I think what you is submitted, that's what you get. I think what she's trying to say is basically coming through the summer, our board hasn't been brief exactly on what was submitted and how it was submitted and what priority the board has actually placed on it. Staff is probably fully engaged and it may turn out that that's exactly what um, what we end up doing. But I'm telling you right now, we we haven't been briefed and, and had a lot of discussion amongst ourselves as to exactly what direction we want to go. I can tell you that there's a significant amount of um, discussion in Stafford over the lack of the, the, the state pushing uh, certain types of development around the Centerport Parkway that the parkway isn't designed to handle and that we will soon have to start rejecting and turning down those, those big distribution center projects and stuff because the interchange was not designed for that kind of traffic. So if the state wants to keep that area um, moving um, in that direction, and they they're, they're boy they're encouraging all these big companies to come in and build in there. Um, something's got to be done at Centerport Parkway, and it's not going to be cheap. It needs to get built in there. Yeah. But I don't see any discussion about that um, from the state, from any anybody recognizing <laughs> that that's going to be an issue. So we we well, do have that as a project. The Centerport Parkway is one of the on the list. And tweak the details of that if, if um, Snapper would say, well, then we slightly change it. We can tweak the details. It but is already on the list in a sense. My, my issue, though, with that would be that I don't think that, that those types of improvements we've been recommending or have been recommending are comprehensive enough to deal with the type of traffic we're talking about getting there. So, I mean, we're talking about many, 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 many large truck traffic now going through an intersection that already is failing in a lot of ways. Um, now, so I wasn't here when that was that. designed, I mean, that was the season work. I was, so we will turn that project off and see, but it was my understanding that was an industrial interchange and it was expected to be industrial through there, but we will dust that off when the list comes to us and take a look and we can give you uh, You You aren't here back then but they changed, it was supposed to be an interchange for an outer connector. Mm -hmm. So it was very comprehensive in a global leap and how it was going to be handled, lots of traffic. But when that project went away, whoosh, it, in typical Virginia fashion, they shrunk it all down and, yeah. and made it. But I mean, all you got to do is look at it. Anyone intuitively would look at that intersection or that interchange and know that it cannot handle the traffic that's going to be on, on that. I mean, Amazon is just getting ready to announce there. You know, we got FedEx, we got all those big companies that are building this big. It's just not going to, it's not working. There are no lights. You know, we got a stop sign at Mountain View Road. And I mean, you know, come on, it's just not going it, to, it's just not going to work. And nobody, I don't think, from the state who are pushing the front, you know, so the economic development arm is saying one thing, but the, the traffic is going to be worse and worse. And we're going to, it's going to, it's going to shut down. Right. Really? Mr. Chair, yes. okay, just our no, no problem, Mr. Chair. Um, Stephen will tell you that that intersection design was designed to have all those additional improvements that you're talking about. So, with but this, did you say that it was, or that you think it was, or because no, what she Stephen just Stephen spoke in one of our meetings. Would you correct the well, detail? In terms of what is out there, what was constructed. There is adequate space for additional ramps and loops and such. Uh, it was designed with one exception. That's the southbound exiting ramp. When that was under construction, we ran into really bad materials. We actually had to tuck that ramp in. So we didn't keep the amount of space of being there. There will be some, if we ever go back and expand the interchange, there will have to be some adjustment made to that. But the, all the other loops and such would fit into some sort of a cloverleaf or directional ramp interchange 
Anyway. And we have enough right away to, to build some of that as well as the additional bridges over 95, but certainly not to. But okay. well, yeah, we, can, we can discuss yeah, this. We need a map. We need a map about it. All right. I think it's the first staff and maybe not to discuss. Uh, so we can make sure we get the details down. So, Mr. Chair, I need to now remind you all that we need to submit the project intake forms on October the 15th. So, now, October the 15th, we need to be able to submit a list so that DDOT can begin reviewing the list. That does not mean that we cannot change the, the details of these projects. But it does mean that we need to come to the list that we can submit on October. Now, this is not considered as an action item tonight. So, does that mean that are we, do we need a vote to approve this list tonight? We don't need a vote as such because there's no final list being approved. However, we do need to submit a list of projects. So, Adam, do you want to comment on any technical part of this process? But we we do need on the 15th to say these are projects we're considering for our final list. Can we not please go and do the technical work that's required on these projects? We can't um, delay that if we, if we, I don't know what happens, Marcy, if we don't submit it by the 15th, but I know that we have a deadline to submit on the 15th. That's, that's up to the board, Mr. Chair. We're not proposing a board take action tonight since there's going to be two, two times later in the process where we are going to come back and say we need approval on this. So right now we think given we think this that set of regional projects, we're going to push these forward and let the other come back to us and say, let's change this one, let's swap this one out. So at this point, we're not requesting any action. All right, so we do have the opportunity to swap them out after this October 15th mm -hmm. deadline if we so choose. Yes. That is the question that VDOT should answer, not the staff of FAMPO, yes. because mm -hmm. I don't want to put FAMPO in a difficult position. Yeah. So, oh, the Kathy answered that. So the October 15th deadline is the deadline so that we can get our ducks in a row and get all of the work that goes into these applications, which is pretty extensive, especially on things like Center Court and other things, um, you know, at that scale. So the idea is that we have this, this comprehensive and complete list with the details, and I'm hearing things about adding transit to this piece and adding, you know, bike head to that piece. And those are all the details in our form that we've asked to have. You know, if somebody has a Sharpie and they draw on a map, we want this here and that there. That's the kind of information that we'd like to have instead of coming in sometime a month after the full apps are due, or a month before rather, to say, now we want to add this piece and add that piece. Because that's where we've been in the past on some things, and it doesn't put any of us in a good spot. So the goal is to have as solid as we can. There is a pipeline study that is looking at the area center for it, not one. Um, we did have to have the county uh, representatives with that kickoff meeting see if we get a lot of details. They did provide some information on plans, but if there's other information and other details that we need to know to give the consultants for that study, um, you know, please let us know that. And then um, there are, we, we acknowledge that there won't be recommendations from those studies by October 15th, we realize that. And so I think some of the different applicants have looked to have a placeholder, knowing that they would want to have a project that would come about from that study. So it's it's our way to be able to help better serve the needs of all the applicants to do that. There is there's nothing saying that VDOT has to develop that information for any applicant. Uh, applicants can you know, hire consultants to do that. If there's any other staff that can do that information, we'll still be required to review. So there is work that we'll have to do on it. But you know, everyone is certainly more than welcome to do that, you know, outside of, you know, our So we're not finally committed to this list until the next round in first of April. For purposes of actually applying, that is correct. For purposes of us being able to provide assistance, that's where it gets much more complicated. So you don't want a completely new project where you have to do engineering work is what you're saying. Correct. And especially if there are studies that may be involved in that, um, anytime we deal with things with the interstate, that opens up a, a whole host of things that, you know, again, Stephen's going to be expert on all of the requirements that will be involved in any of those applications. There have been times that 
the discussions around the first of the year with different applicants where they're looking for things in and around the interstate that require, you know, an IAR, but there is not time to develop that. There is a time to collect the data and develop that by the time the application is in. And so we, we don't want that to happen. So under those conditions with the chair, could I request for the policy committee to make a decision whether or not we can submit these projects to that pre pre approval list to request VDOT to start the work on the 15th? If you do not want us to submit that list on the 15th, then we've got a larger scale problem. No, 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 they need to be, they need to be submitted. Um, Mr. Chair, does that mean that we're, now that becomes an active request now that becomes an active action item instead of a discussion item? I'm afraid it does. I don't, I don't think they want the choice to at least submit this with a free free approval. So. Bearing in mind that what you can say from VPUP is that something's been changed. Yes. And so that we can request those changes that are, uh, you know, appropriate, that some of those studies might come back with recommendations, which we don't know right now, so we can't program them yet. But the idea would be that we submit these lists so that they can begin their work um, at this stage. But uh, I'd leave it to be Dr. Say allowed and not allowed after today. Yeah. And, and keep in mind <clears throat> that if the five counties here in GWRC plus GWRC in Pepper, you're looking at like 35 projects that VDOT would have to, to do. And our resources are limited. You have a high vacancy rate right now. But remember, we have 11 other counties that can also submit five and typically they submit anywhere depending on the county one to five so that adds another multitude of projects that we have to do within the same time period so it's not that we're being difficult or we don't like you or anything like that it's a lot of projects and we still have a lot of other counties to serve too and we don't want to short them anything because their needs are just as important to them as your needs are to you. And our counties can submit still their five local projects in addition to these, right? These are the regional ones only. So we're not telling anybody what to do on their local project list of another five. Checking for the For example, Sapphire could submit another five projects on their local list in addition to this. All right, so do we really, Chairman? Yes. Mark Cindy and everybody in staff, you know, the plan was we do this because it's more of an administrative to begin a process of looking at projects. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody has an issue with that. So I don't, no, I would rather not suddenly throw a vote into, <clears throat> into a board meeting because frankly, it surprised me that's when we do that for that. Unless you guys are having any super hardware about it. It's understood that you guys yeah. have some other things to go forward with that you'll bring to the attention of whomever and so, we'll have to deal with it. So, right, we, so then we unless forward. anybody wants to, I'm just going to move right now and we'll move on to the next item. So we can submit these items. Yes. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Moving on. 7C Resolution 22 06 Supporting Transportation Alternatives Program Application. Hi. So there's a resolution. Um, okay. The resolution before you is in support of the Transportation Alternatives Project for Spotsylvania Stafford and Hedgesburg. Stafford has, <laughs> has three projects, Salisbury Drive Sidewalk, Forest and Wood Sidewalk, and the Belmont Third Town Trail K-6. Spotsylvania County also has three projects, Safe Rocks School Chancellor Park Drive Sidewalk, Grand Point Drive Charity Path, and Spotsylvania Parkway Extension to Smith Station Road. And the city of Fredericksburg have the same slide trail. So these projects need our endorsement tonight to go forward for transportation alternatives. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Mr. Chairman, for Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there any questions? Mr. Chair, I'll move resolution 2206. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Seven side, motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 7D, Resolution 22-07, approving the 2015 LRTP fiscally constrained project list. Um, Mr. Chair, we only received uh, one comment, which, could you just pull it up, Andy? Um, on the um, draft list. Um, so, this is um, dealing with Route 217, the 
City of Fredericksburg Texas Park and down to New Post. This reflects a, a, a widening of the road. If you go back to the presentation you've just seen, you'll see that that specific area is included between Spotsylvania and the city for a small scale project application. It doesn't quite go as far down to New Post as re requested here, but it certainly addresses this particular um, request from the member of the public. So I think we can safely point them to the project that we've just agreed to submit to uh, the small scale application process. It's slightly different to this, not exactly, but it's in the area that the person has requested. So I'm quite happy to say we feel comfortable that having received this public comment, we've addressed it partially already in our small scale application. Next one, Matthew. So this is the presentation I'm going to run through you. You'll remember you received those full printed out versions of the list last time. We had a presentation on that. Just want to show you where we are in the process quickly. Hold on to the next slide. Um, there are a couple of adjustments since the list that you saw last time. Just want to tell you what those are. Um, Matthew, can you scroll down? So um, there's a slight overlap here that we have to adjust for because we found that some of the projects and and our the staff of Spotsylvania and Stafford and so on pointed this out to us there are one or two projects where the roadway project is double counted uh sorry the active transportation bike path or whatever sidewalk is double counted in the roadway project so we, we can't double count so we managed to reduce that problem by pairing up the sidewalk and roadway projects and making sure that there wasn't any double counting either on the funding side or on the cost side. So we checked for that and that meant a couple of small tweaks. Um, we incorporated the transportation alternatives program uh, projects that have been applied for by your jurisdictions because it's required to be included in the RTD. So that meant we had to put it in, which meant again some slight adjustments to the list that you saw last time. And also the inflation rate we had our consultant look at the list we did and the calculations we did, and they said we haven't quite adjusted properly for inflation. So we fixed that in this version, which um, we're now asking to move forward with. Next slide. Um, Excuse just, me, you haven't adjusted for inflation. What inflation rate were you using before? before you go, oh, you go back one. Yeah, so the initial proposal had inflation done on a simple inflation basis and having compounded that rate. So this year over year not yeah. compounded. So we needed to compound it and uh, we have compounded it now to make sure that we're not cheating, right? So we uh, fixed we're not cheating, we not we fixed the inflation Matt, issue. Yes, Our consultant went through everything we've done with a fine tooth comb. Okay. What we left with is 53 of the 56 highway projects have been included. That's quite a record. We have to almost none have to be rejected, right? Of those 16 of them, um, Mr. Chairman of CTAC, I think the CTAC or the DPAC asked this question. 16 of these have active transportation elements in the highway project itself. Then there's separate 29 of the 76 active transportation projects we also approved. 11 of the uh, 11 transit projects we were able to uh, uh, include. And all of the requests for preliminary engineering studies, et cetera. Have been included. Projects should expect to fund based on the available uh, data that we have. Um, we skipped one if it was a colossal project for 100 million or whatever, it just wouldn't fit. So, there, as you can see, only three of the highway projects that were not able to be included. Next slide. This just gives you the, the matrix of. And where the current, the PE studies are listed, we are here. And we've done the projects by mode as well. And we've done the cost by mode, so you can see that you've already got all this information on any later point. 343 will be the total projects that we've included in LRT. Next slide. Is that the last slide? Okay, so let's go back to the agenda. All right. The CTAC and the new chair, congratulations, has been elected. And the CTAC met recently and looked at this project list. 
and have made a recommendation to the policy committee, which I don't know, maybe you can click on it. And the request is basically that the CTAC members voted seven to four to say that we should, in that project list, include a new highway crossing. And because the new highway crossing is not in that project list, they would like the Tampa Policy Committee to give some, take some attention to the fact that we need a new highway um, crossing. And that's whether the letter to yourselves, um, which is also included in your pack. And I just point your attention to that right now. Next item. So the draft project list, again, is in your pack. It's very small. To read through these would, would kill you, so I'm not going to read through them. You've seen them now for the second time. The TAC and our committees have seen them now. The TAC has seen this again for a second time. The TAC is quite happy with this project list as it is. All members from all jurisdictions are happy at a staff level with this, these projects. And so we're asking you to do two things. We have to get the air quality conformity process underway in order to finish the LRTP, right? So those projects, all those several hundred projects, have got to go through that process. We've discussed with BDOC and the federal partners how to handle that. And we're recommending that you tonight take action to allow us to submit this project list to start a quality conformity process. And remember, that's an onerous thing. It's thankfully in our region less onerous because we, what's the right phrase, Adam? Are we in conformity? Well, the, the conformity process is yeah, the maintenance area. We're in the maintenance area, so it's less onerous on ourselves than it could have been. But that process needs to be out of the way, so that's. Revolution 2208 and 2209 is authorizing the TAC to approve the draft report when we get to that point. And that's to avoid you all having to come back to have another meeting. That's the purpose of that, is to say that you would empower the TAC to receive that air quality conformity report on your behalf. So those are the two resolutions we're asking for tonight. And those are all the documents that were all in your TAC. So I think you've all seen them already, but we need to ask you to um, approve those two resolutions to allow us to move forward with the air quality conformity process for the TAC to meet with, the, um, with our federal and state partners and to kick off that process through the analysis. All right. Thank you. Do you have any uh, questions? Yes, Michelle. Um, so first we have to, you got the two bottom resolutions you talked to, but the first one we've got to do is basically approve basically the overall plan first and then the next two phases. Um, with regards to the river crossing issue, and some of us around this table have yeah. gone around and around on that one quite a few times, and it always becomes a very, shall I say, interesting conversation. <laughs> I just leave it at that. Um, if there was some type of recommendation to look at, that's one thing. But if they want, if, if the CTAC wants to come back and have a discussion and say, hey, we'd really like you to consider something, that's fine. But to try to put something into this now, it would be, would it be appropriate to say problematic. Um, so I'm going to go ahead at this point, if it's all right, and move resolution, first move resolution 2207, approving the 2050 long range transportation plan. Yeah, I'll hand over there. Maybe you want to ask it as a second. Yes, yeah, I'll second. All right, now discussion. I, I'm coming on the board. Please. Okay. The, the CTAC saw the list. There's a lot of good individual things there, but from a regional perspective, we believe that the number one issue for the <laughs> residents of this region is mitigation of the gridlock on I 95 and Rock. I've been a staff resident for 24 years, uh, and I've seen this thing go round and round. And what we can hope to convey to you is that action is required because it's not going to get better with age. And unless we get moving and stop <clears throat> worrying about past history, <clears throat> you are going to inhibit just the, the quality of life of the residents, let alone 
the commercial appeal for the I-95 Route 1 work. And so while I understand there's a lot of baggage associated with this, the kicking down the road, we feel, is not a good option. Thank you. Any other discussion? Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I haven't looked at it for a long time. I completely agree that in 2050 plan, we should look at another river crossing. Can we put in a generalization that we want to look at it that it that has to be included but without specific? Um, just to, just to I don't the, know, wait, wait. Okay. All right. All right. So this question about generalities of uh, control. Can uh, we can't put a general generality into this for air quality conformity. We have to specify the project. We have to specify the location. We have to specify things like the cost. So if you can't just say into that path, we would like another river crossing. <laughs> what you have to say is we want the river crossing at this spot. You've got to specifically yeah, identify yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's, unfortunately, that's the problem. Okay, so I, I, don't, I don't think that I would like to interfere the, the, the process of deciding what to do on the river crossing. I'm just saying from a technical point of view, to start the air quality process, I have to have a specific a location yes. with a specific road with a specific path, and then we can go to this. All right, thank you very much. I don't want to anyway say that we shouldn't look at it, it's just there is no way we're going to get a project on this list tonight. I mean, there's nothing to say we cannot have continue to have the conversation and make modifications later, but for tonight, to get this moving forward. And then again, I, if CTAC wants to have a good conversation, please. No, we know you're good. But so you're just good. tonight, we're going to be able to get something in there. To be included as a funded engineer project tonight. But our sense to you, and since we're just an advisory council, is we've got to get serious about this. And if not tonight, it's got to be done soon. And I think, I, I think we all look forward to having that conversation. If you guys want to spend some time looking at options and saying, hey, we're looking at these options, what do you think? then we can keep you going and we can nobody wants to stop anything it's just tonight we've got to get this done to do certain things and it's always been history is important on this one because choosing crossing sites and stuff uh you know there's river easements involved and things of that nature there's questions of where exactly it goes across and what areas uh which again we've, we've spent a lot of time discussing but that's not to say not have it but just tonight we're not in a position to throw a project onto the list yes, thank you yes I was just going to say, I agree that we, we, there's no way that we could. I actually didn't think that was part of the proposal was to add it. Um, I believe we still have on our um, unconstrained list, not the constrained list, that this particular project, we voted on it two years ago to put it on there because we didn't have a funding or focus. Now COVID's kind of got in between. So I really appreciate CTAC bringing it back to us. Because at one time we were all having active conversations about that at Campo, and then things just kind of got away with it. So thanks for bringing it back. Thank you, Slim. All right. All, Seeing, up. all, right. <laughs> all right. Seeing uh, no further comment, uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Chair, what's that? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, Quiet, Chair, I'll move resolution 22 08. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. There's a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. Thank you. Is it going for the trifecta tonight? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Nooch. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Chair, vote sign. Motion carries. I'll move 22 09. Go ahead, Cindy. <laughs> <laughs> we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Chair, motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We now have two items. Um, the CPAC has been looking for new <laughs> members for a while, and so is DPAC. And we've got tonight two members. <clears throat> um, you'd quite want us to take them together, I guess, a vote on them. But uh, to appoint Jane Leeds as an at large member to the CPAC, and to appoint Kamara Banks as an at large member to the CPAC. And uh, those have been recommended. The documents are before you. I think you know the two people in question. So we just uh, vote you. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll open it up to a combined uh, motion. If so. God bless them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, move for 2210 and 2211. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. All those in, in, any discussion? 
<laughs> All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Sure, votes aye. Motion carries. All right, calendar update. We did a quick calendar update for the board tonight. Um, you'll notice that we have adjusted the calendar now to go all the way up to the end of FY22, so that's next June. Oh my goodness. We spoke with the FAMPO chair a couple weeks ago. We okay. do have a couple of holiday conflicts early in 2022, the calendar year. We mm -hmm. for the month of January and February. Two holidays on the regular meeting basis, policy committee. We have tentatively listed the following Monday, which is going to the GRC meeting here. Uh, to have the FAMPO meeting that night. So that's for discussion, no action is required on that. We tentatively listed that, and we have not gotten quite as far out to June for the policy committee meeting date. There's another holiday in June as well. So we can take the same approach, or we can push the meeting back a few days, but we want to put this before the board for discussion. All right, thank you, Mr. Any Any comments on the January and February meetings? All right, thank you. Do we have any correspondence? Uh, Mr. Chair, you've seen the um, public comment that we received on a number of items. We don't have any additional comments. That any additional correspondence to what we've already seen. We checked the email earlier this evening and there's nothing in the Great, thank you. Any staff and agency reports? Any comment from the staff that I on our side is that we are still looking for a plan um, at the office where it's not one person down and we are interviewing for interim uh, intern until such time as we do not take the planner that we need in our office. So we will start interviews for an intern tomorrow. We have to appoint somebody for a short period to just help us with some of the heavy lifting for a while until we find that missing staff member. Thank you. Ms. Parker? I just wanted to make everybody aware if you haven't seen uh, our social media, the hot spots or anything like that. We've got a lot of work on 95 over the next month. A lot of closures at night. We are getting ready to switch traffic onto the new bridge uh, yeah. there southbound at the river crossing. So that'll be within the next 30 days. Chatham will be opening in a couple of weeks. There'll be an announcement on the date and time on Thursday that will go out. Uh, so we encourage everybody to come and see that. Uh, so a lot, a lot of cool things are happening in the Behaves around the area that hopefully will help relieve uh, a good bit of the traffic that we've had for the past couple of years. All right. Thank you very much. Any other agency reports? All right. Uh, any board member comments? All right. Then we're adjourned. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank <laughs> you.